It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. What a great week for podcasting, Steph. We are recording this as the 2018 Olympics kick off in Pyeongchang, South Korea. In fact, there are competitions, albeit not medal days, happening prior to opening ceremonies. In fact, I was just setting my DVR for ice skating, which kicks off tonight. That's right. It's on like Donkey Kong. And so in (laughs) honor of the Olympics, well, kind of like wine Olympics, really, uh, Val and I thought we'd talk a little bit about Greek wines. And we haven't done that before. So this is fun. And since the first Olympics were held in Greece back in 776 B.C., And then we'll bring this episode home with a factoid on Korean soju. That's right. But first, we drink. And I want to know what Steph is sipping on this afternoon as the biathlon, alpine skiing, luge, and ski jumping and curling competitions are underway halfway around the world really soon. Whoa. I have got, you know, all I'm participating in is the drinking um, at this point. But I would like to take in some watching here pretty soon. Not tonight, but I think, you know, coming up here tomorrow for the opening ceremonies. Oh, yeah. 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 So what I've got here going is the 2015 Elios Red PGI, as in protected geographical indication. This is from Peloponnese, Greece imported by Terlato Wines. And it's a blend, as you could guess. And it's an inexpensive red, only about $10. It's got Ayuridico, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Syrah. And very light bodied and only 12% alcohol. Fresh red fruits, that's like the dominant feature here. Um, Cranberry, strawberry, a very simple drinking simple wine but really for just enjoyment you're not thinking too hard about it because you're you know excited about the olympics all right what about you what are you drinking well speaking of simple (laughs) is that what you're getting at speaking of simple val no actually speaking of simple i am drinking a jinro a shamus shamusul i believe that's how you pronounce it jinro samusul classic soju And this is a distilled spirit, which we're going to talk about later on in the factoid. This one is made with rice and it says grains, various unnamed grains. It's about 20.1% alcohol by volume. And for this one, again, can't wait to get the factoid here. This one, you have to budget out a stiff $4.99 for a 375 ml bottle. But it is exactly what what we were talking about. It is very simple. It's a neutral spirit. Uh, doesn't have, you know, a lot of aroma on the nose. It doesn't taste like, it doesn't taste like a whole lot. It's it's a little viscous in the mouth and it's got a little bit of a, a sweet sensation, which we know isn't a flavor. Does it have some burn? No, no burn at all. Okay. Really well integrated alcohol, but um, I'm only sipping it too out of a shot glass. You're supposed to do this in a shooter. Val doesn't do shots. I learned that lesson back in the 90s. So it sounds like it needs to be mixed with something. Yes. And um, I could tell you soju slushy stories from many, many years ago, because that's the only way I've ever had it. And that was like 18 years ago. I had soju slushies in Korea and there was dancing. But this... Don't give away all the good stories. I know, but this is... We got to wait till the factoid. This is pretty simple. It's easy to drink. Again, there's a sweet sensation, maybe a little bit of floral to it, maybe a little bit of light stone fruit, but not not a whole lot going on here but i can see where it's a very very easy to drink thing so we should get into what we're supposed to be talking about here yes let's do it olympics the olympics okay so we're gonna start by mentioning that although the first winter olympics were held back in 1924 in Chamonix, France, and we do drink a lot of French wine on the show, the Olympic tradition does date back, as Steph mentioned earlier, thousands of years to Greece. Now, we don't drink a lot of Greek wine on this show, so we thought it would be fun to start with a quick regional wrap, and we're going to start in northern Greece. So if you're watching Nordic Combined, 
Then perhaps it's worth seeking out a wine from northern Greece. This region borders Macedonia, includes Naussa, famous for the po powerful red Sino Mavro wines. Uh, Butari is a well-known producer here, so their wines are pretty easy to find. Easy to find with Nordic combined. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> I love how this is really a Olympic wine pairing. You know, That's it's not like, what this started out as. This sport goes with these wines you know i think it's fun now it's just a suggestion but you know this is something you really could do and then you can tell us how it went for you <laughs> I, I know it's, it's it did start out this way it just kind of worked you know i had the olympic schedule up and we're looking at the regions we're looking at the wines and why not steph so why not yeah all right well traveling through greece let's go to central greece where you find athens Delphi, or sometimes pronounced Delphi, and Mount Olympus. But guess what? Mount Olympus is not the home of the Olympics. Kind of sounds like it is, but it's not. And we'll get to that next. Central Greece is, however, home of Retsina. I'm sure you've heard of that. And it's traditionally made with the white Savatiano and Roditas grapes. And about a thousand grams per liter of pine resin, where it gets its name and flavor, which is so crazy. I think I've only had that once ever, and it was hilarious because it was. I did it. I had it blind, and you knew exactly what it was. I think we <laughs> talked about that with Susan Castrava as well. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's right. Because she she had mentioned that she was kind of geeking out on that. Yeah, that's cool. It's an yeah, acquired and, taste. That's that's for sure. I've had it. I had it in wine school and I was really surprised by it. Could I drink it? Yeah. Do I want to? No. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, uh, another important grape uh, in central Greece are the red Zeno Mavro wines. And uh, they are also common in Repsani, where Mount Olympus is located. And when I was in Greece, I didn't get all the way up to Mount Olympus. It was really out of our way, but would be a cool place to go. Yeah, and I think it was important to point out that that is not where, like you mentioned, where the Olympics originated. It was actually in the Peloponnese Peninsula. <laughs> this is the Peloponnese Peninsula, Palooza. And it's west of Athens. And this is where you're going to find not only a third of Greece's wine production and grape growing, but this is also where you find the most Appalachians, the regions of Nemea and Patras. Olympia's ancient site is actually located on this peninsula. So this is actually where the Olympic Games began. So we're going to take a quick minute, raise our glasses to the archaeological site where today's Olympic Games began as really, it began as a religious gathering. So let's just drink to that real quick. It was a very spiritual place. Cheers. Mm, cheers. And we're going to go ahead and include a couple blog posts because Steph's actually kind of tootled around that area as well. And then we'll have a few extra photos in the uh, Patreon site for you guys as well. But back Sweet. to the wine. Here yeah, in the back to the wine. I know. Here in the Peloponnese Peninsula, Pelusa is Patras. Say that five times really fast. This is where production <laughs> is mainly focused on fortified red wines made mainly with the Mavrodaphne, again, five times faster, as well as the white Roditas and musket wines. Nemea is also found on the northeastern part of the Peloponnese Peninsula, and they have these hot summers and these red soils, but they're at higher altitudes. So this allows for the ripening of the Iortico. Uh, Say it again. Ioritico. Ioritico. I have such a hard time with that one. Ioritico. Uh, the Ioritico grapes. And these grapes make a deeply colored, full-bodied wine known as Hercules blood. And why not? Why not name a wine after a mythical fight between the lion of Nemea and Hercules? I think that's really cool. It, it is cool. And I don't think lion fighting was in the original Olympics. But yeah, I never heard. I have to be honest. I have never heard of Hercules blood before. I've heard of bull's blood from Hungary, right. but not not this. Have you? Did you try it? No. Nope. No, nope, I haven't heard of it. Never seen it. So it's a, it's a curiosity for me. Huh. Yeah. But, you know, I, I think I've mentioned before how I was in uh, Nemea and which is only about an hour and 15 minutes to really kind of get out there and start doing some wine tasting. We went to Domaine Skouras even when we didn't have an appointment and got some VIP treatment. It was pretty spectacular. And those wines are easy to find. Yes. So as far as looking for a producer, 
this one is totally affordable, like all Greek wines for the most part are. So definitely something to check out. But back to these uh, lions. Yes, there will not be any lion slaying in this year's Olympic Games, but there will be cross-country skiing if you want to pair that with the wines from the islands of Crete. Crete is where it is believed that vineyards in the Mediterranean actually originated. But there is also the island of Santorini. And this is the one you always see in the pictures, you know, with the blue roofs and the blue sea and the white buildings. So we could pair those Assyrtico wines that come from Santorini with maybe some ski jumping. This is an interesting aspect of Greek viticulture that should not be jumped over. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, this island is hot and windy. So the grapes are actually grown close to the ground and they're trained in these basket shapes that they call kouloris configurations. Did you see any of those when you were there? The, oh the yeah, baskets. I have pictures that'll be in our blog. Great. And then the vines are actually protected not only from the wind and the sun, but also water evaporation. So when it's hot, when it's dry and the wind is blowing, instead of drying out those vines, that basket shape kind of helps retain some of the water or protect some of that water usage there. So vines are trained in this manner. They're naturally low yielding, but they can last up to 75 years before they are cut off. And then a new vine will grow on the existing rootstock. And they sometimes have these rootstocks that are like 300 years old. Yes. Unbelievable. I know. That's crazy. 300 year old roots because there's no phylloxera. And it's believed that some of these vines in Santorini could predate the first Winter Olympics. Yeah, that's just like mind blowing. But you know, one of the things about Santorini, I have to tell people if you're going to do the cruising, which is how I wound up in Greece for part of the trip, at least the island part. You won't usually get to spend very much time in Santorini, and it's a, it's a terrible thing because there's so much great wine and so much to see. So if you really want to geek out about those wines there on the island, you know, try and make sure that you have more than one day because I was only there for a short period of time, and they have so much to taste there. I don't know what it is about Greece. I've only been there once and I was there for a whole 24 hours. I was actually on a layover, believe it or not. And I tried to oh. see as much of it and eat as many things as I could before we had to get back on the plane. So it's definitely one of those things where you, you probably want to spend some time in Santorini, spend some time on the other islands that even don't even have to work, that don't have a lot of, you know, wine culture behind them. But each island has its own flavor each, you know, just like anywhere else you go, just like every region of Italy is different. Every area of Greece is different, too. So you can't just kind of summarize it up. But we are going to go ahead and wrap up the uh, regional wrap with the island of Samos and the Aegean Sea just across this narrow strait. It's like a mile wide, I believe it is, from Turkey. And this is where we find the legendary musket of Samos. And these wines, they must be made with the muscat blanc. Petit, a petit grand. And these comprise about 95% of the planting. So we're all familiar with the Moscato or the musket grape, which is where this comes from. And a lot of the grapes that we have now, a lot of people believe that this is one of those historical, one of the oldest grapes. So, you know, people say, well, what kind of wine did they drink in the Bible? A lot of times when you kind of, you know, chime into an historical conversation about that, it's probably going to be a musket type grape because these grapes right. it's, it's like the musket of alexandria is actually i believe the oldest so they have these steep slopes that ascend up to three thousand feet above sea level and it is also here on samos that is the home of nectar de samos now i've never had this stuff have you no but want to i know anytime they dry grapes in the sun anytime they do this they do it in Pantelleria off the coast of Sicily. They, it's a Mediterranean thing. I love it. Anytime they do this, they concentrate the sugars. And this, of course, yields a non-fortified wine that can still exceed 14%. But you got to figure out how long that fermentation is going to have to happen to get all those sugars fermented to an alcohol level of 14%. And then it goes into wood for three years. So three years is required as a minimum. I believe that's still the requirement. So I would think if you can get your hands on something like that, a musket wine from Samos, that sweet treat should warm you up while you're watching snowboarding. Right, Steph? Yay. <laughs> yes, that would make me very happy. 
And to summarize all this, we have a few things that we just want you to remember about the grapes specifically, because there are over 300 varieties that are indigenous to Greece and many other grape varieties that are also international too that that you'll see there. But we want you to remember a few of them that might come up here and there or you might see in the store on a menu. For reds, you're thinking Zeno Mavro, Ayuridico, and Mavro Daphne. And for the whites, you're thinking Savatiano, Assyrtico, Roditas, and Robola, which is actually Ribola Gialla. And white wines are made from Moscow Filero, which has more of a pinkish, reddish, grayish <laughs> color skin. And so it's kind of confusing, but they do, it does make white wines. Right. And factoid. And there you go. Now on to the factoid. All right. Bring it home, Bell. We're going to bring it home with the factoid. So Korea's national drink is soju. And since that's where the Olympics are being held this year, we thought it would be really cool to explore some of the beverages. And there are more. This isn't the only thing they make. But what drew my attention to soju is because, well, I was able to find it, first of all. And, and second of all, I've had it, but I've only had it in the form of a soju slushy in a Songtan bar just outside of Osan Air Force Base like back in 2000. So I never really got to have it by itself. So I bought a bottle and as the description mentions, it's a clear neutral distilled spirit. And it is a little sweeter and a little fuller bodied than say like a vodka. You know, vodka tends to be more crisp, more clean, more precise. Uh, This one is made with a variety of ingredients. Uh, They've got for base ingredients, you can have anything from potatoes, to wheat, to barley, to tapioca, even sweet potatoes. The one I have in my glass right now is made with rice and it says grains. It could be a variety of grains. So they aren't specific which one. Yeah, mystery Mystery grains. grains. But what I didn't know is that rice, even though it was traditionally used, it was banned for soju distillation during the 90s after the annexation of Korea by Japan. So as of 99, they were able to start using rice again for soju. So here's the kicker. Soju has consistently been a top selling spirit in the world for years. So if you've ever done any kind of like market reading or whatever for your studies, you're going to find Jinro right at the top of that list. Nearly 72 million cases just in 2016, according to Spirits Business. So we'll link that up so you can see what is being sold around the world. So even though it's something you may not have had, the spirits world is global. I mean, the Asian market is such a huge part of that that you can't really, if, if you're in the business of spirits, you can't really ignore that. I'm sure the spirit, don't you think that the spirits business or even just the Asian market is like, why are any of these American publications and media outlets ever talking about soju? You know, because it is pretty amazing. I mean, I'm over here shaking my head going, how is this such a big deal and no nobody really over here is drinking it because we're ethnocentric and it's all about us oh no no i didn't say that but um (laughs) i i don't know i it's something that it's not it's not heavily imported here i would or or marketed no it's not heavily marketed but the fact that i found it sitting on the shelf was quite extraordinary and i think different markets you know receive it differently it's just like baiju and some of these other distilled spirits that are that are you know, right. But the alcohol in soju can vary. I mean, you've seen it just under 17% to somewhere over 50%. So I remember when I was over there in 2000, somebody said, you never know what you're going to get in your soju slushy. Like sometimes I would drink a couple of them and I didn't feel anything. And then sometimes they're like, well, some of it, it wasn't really regulated, so to speak. And that's what I was told at the time. I don't know how that's changed. But most of what you're going to find on the market is kind of where I'm drinking right now, between 20 and 24 percent. Traditionally, like most alcohol in most cultures, it is served with food and it's usually served by someone else. So apparently you're not supposed to pour your own and you're supposed Uh-oh. to. Yeah. So usually or you turn into a pumpkin. Yeah. Somebody else has to pour it for you. And I did read somewhere and I can't remember where it was that it was like the eldest person at the table. You know how when you're doing psalm training, you always pour for the oldest woman at the table? And, you know, yeah. And then you work your way around the table. Well, the oldest person at the table pours your soju. And then you're supposed to turn your head and not look them in the eye when you do your shooter. Oh. 
which is the total opposite of how we were taught to drink our toasts in Italy, where you look people in the eye or that's seven years of bad sex. So, you know, make of that what you will. That's a serious thing. Make of that what you will. Yes. But uh, yeah, I believe I've had it only in the form of perhaps too many soju slushies and songtan bars. And there was a pole and there was dancing and I was mistaken for a Russian juicy dancer. Um, at the point where the bartender wouldn't serve me because she thought I was supposed to be working there in a bar one night. But for a little more reading about soju in the States, there are cocktails, there are brands. I guess that pop, uh, Psy? Is it Gangnam Style? Gangnam Style? Oh? Yeah, you know, yeah. The, the guy, yeah. you know, um, I, I guess he had, he had, a, <laughs> you're, that list, was so funny. Listeners, be glad you can't see that. But apparently he's had, the Psy has had a major influence in soju sales when it comes to the Western world. So we've got a fun little piece from Norman Miller and the Guardian from a few years back that you can, you can check out. And also Justine Sterling did an article in 2015 in Food and Wine that talks about some other Korean alcoholic beverages to be on the lookout for as you curl up with some curling or binge on some bobsleigh which kicks <laughs> off today well you know i do have a uh american soju that i would recommend i tasted it last year at the palm bay international wine and spirits tour it's called yobo soju and it's y-o-b-o which actually is a korean term of endearment which means sweetheart or honey Aww. and uh i met the husband of the Korean American woman entrepreneur who seems like a real badass. Her name's Carolyn Kim, and she created this uh, soju because she wanted something really good to drink for herself. And she's a mother of uh, of twin boys, I guess, and she felt like she <laughs> probably needed a uh, needed a drink at the end of the night that wouldn't give her a hangover. And so she is making this soju from grapes that are grown up there in upstate New York and she's working with the Finger Lake Distilling Company to make her spirit and I tasted it and thought it was wow like super smooth has some of that sweetness but definitely something you could enjoy by itself no no slushy required so I wonder if she's making it with grapes why she's not calling it a brandy is it is it know. because of the alcohol levels? I'm just curious. On, you I know. think it is. It has something to do with probably the alcohol levels. Yes, or she has other base ingredients that maybe I don't know. I'm just curious about that. I'm like, well, why is yeah. you know what makes it specifically a soju? Other yeah, than from I don't where think it's, it's the particular grain necessarily. Obviously, you can have yams or you can make soju with, like you were saying, barley. I've tried it a few different soju's in you know japanese restaurants Mm -hmm. and um and you know obviously with with how uh or the the base ingredient changes the flavor but you know overall cool cool spirit something to look out for yes so in our next segment we're going to call it where in the w25 world are we and we're doing this because steph and i do other things you know, besides the podcast, I mean, the podcast is a great, uh, a great place for us to come together, but we do other things. You guys have heard uh, Steph talk about the Women of the Vine and Spirits Symposium and some of the wonderful things they're doing on this show. And we talked to Susan Castrava from Wine Enthusiast, who was, who's, she's one of their board, advisory board members, right? That's right. And Steph is now a brand ambassador for Women of the Vine and Spirits. So Steph, can you tell us a little bit about what that entails? Yes, well, I'm one of three brand ambassadors that uh, right now are going to be promoting Women of the Vine and Spirits and having some regional events and, you know, bringing just a lot of um, attention to the organization that's still very young and a lot of people aren't aware of it because this is only its fourth year and yet there now is an international uh, European arm with their own European advisory board. So it is growing and it's a network of women that are helping promote other women in the wine and spirit industry. I love that. So if you can get a chance to go to one of the symposiums or check out the website and see how you can get involved in your local area, definitely check that out. We will link up the website for you. And of course, I 
produced a couple of podcasts recently for the Wine Scholar Guild that you guys might be interested in. They were all with Andrew Jefford, which to me was a dream. He's ever so charming. And the first one was on the Languedoc Roussillon. And then we did one last week with Jane Hunt, Master of Wine, on the Tuscany tour. And, you know, Tuscany, that's kind of my jam. That's where I started. So I was totally riveted during the whole thing and just found it an absolutely, if you love Tuscany and you want to hear about the different vineyards of Bulgari and and all the different the history of the Maremma and some of the things that she talks about, definitely check that one out. And then, of course, I got to sit in a San Francisco restaurant with Christophe Tasson a couple weeks ago. And if you don't know who he is, he actually is one of the, I want to say 18 or so, if even, uh, moths. Meilleur d'ouvrier de France. It's uh, best sommelier in all of France. And he he won earned that in 2004. It took him 17 years to get there. And I wow. think, yeah, he was so charming, but we talked about, he's going to be the uh, immersion trip guide on the Rhone. So you can go to winescholarguild.org and check out the tours and their blog and, or go to iTunes because they're on their fourth episode of their podcast now. And they're all with Andrew Jefford, who is just absolutely lovely. And so you guys can check those out too. So we thought Very cool. that's kind of fun. It is kind of it fun, is. you know, kind of spreading our love around the wine world and, helping other organizations promote as well. Exactly. And we also want to give some love to our patron, Janet Adams, because she left us a really nice message and we want to share it with everybody. This is this is the kind of thing that just makes our day. So please continue anybody to to leave us notes and tell us why you're listening and how you're listening. Janet tells us, quote, listening to episode 147 on my drive to Denver. Thank you, Steph and Val, for traveling with me on my current weekly trips. Love listening to the different guests and all I continue to learn. A shout out to the two of you for entertaining me. Know you always place a smile on my face and often make me laugh out loud. I'm very happy to be a Patreon supporting you and all you offer. Back on episode 147, I am in need of experiencing the Empress Gin Martini. Steph, you had me on the blue to pink and the gin flavor notes. I'm a tad excited, unquote. Well, we are excited too, Janet. Thank you for the note. And we also want to thank all of our patrons who support us, our tenacious tasters, Jeff E. from the award-winning We Like Drinking podcast, Lynn from Savor the Harvest blog, Sebastian of Sassy Italy Tours, Jen in Maryland, David and Lisa in Illinois, Anne-Marie in Virginia, and our It's Not 5 O'Clock and We Don't Care listener level, Meg in South Dakota, Clay in Arizona, John, Andrew, and Aswani in California, Chantal in Ontario, Mary Lou in Pennsylvania, Kathy in Georgia, Chris and that Janet, <laughs> Diane in Colorado. We're in Colorado, too. For anybody who doesn't know that, if you're a new listener, Val and I are in Colorado. And Steve and Renee in Illinois, Kathy in Tennessee, Ashley in North Carolina, and Sean in Ohio. We also have Tastemaker listeners. We have David in Scotland, Carol in Kentucky, and Karen in California. And you, too, can go to our Patreon page for details. Just go to www.patreon.com slash wine25podcast. Spell it out. And then you can see how to be entered into our monthly drawing, exclusive content, and swag. And we're here for you every week. We're pretty easy to get a hold of between episodes. You can find us in the social spaces at Wine to Five. And we encourage you to join our private Facebook group called the Wine to Five Community. I'm Val. You can find me on Twitter at Wine Gal Unboxed. And also on the Vino with Val Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest pages. And Steph is everywhere online as the Wine heroin so we wish you all a happy olympics a happy week and a great weekend and cheers cheers. thank you for listening to the wine to five podcast be sure to check us out at facebook slash wine two five and tune in next week for more fun and useful sip tips